What you're seeing right now on your screen is a dark green tourmaline found by Adriano from the channel Adriano Precious Stones. Look closely at the place. It's not a movie style mine. There's no machinery, no professional mining look. It's just a dull dirt bank, a simple road cut with brown soil, broken rock, and a bit of grass. If you drove past that spot, you probably wouldn't give it a second look. And yet, that's exactly where this crystal came from. The key point is that this is not a one in a million miracle. This is actually possible in many places around the world. In a lot of regions, roads are built right across areas with gemstone potential. When a highway is carved through the hills, heavy equipment removes several feet of soil and exposes rock faces that used to be buried. What used to be hidden deep underground is suddenly out in the open in a roadside wall just like this. And many of those rocks are not just rock. They can be granitic pegmatites that host tourmaline, beryl, and topaz. They can be schists and gneisses typical of environments with garnet, kyanite, storolite, and sometimes even corundum, the mineral behind rubies and sapphires. They can be basalt flows full of cavities that end up filled with agate, amethyst, and colorful chalcedony. In some areas, they can be serpentinites associated with nephrite jade. All of that literally sliced open and left in full view for anyone who knows what to look for. Most people just drive by. They see dirt, ugly rock, a boring roadside. They never connect a dull, lifeless-looking bank with the possibility of having, inside that broken material, a tourmaline like Adriano's, a well-formed garnet, a piece of jade or an agate geode. What's missing is one skill we're going to work on today. Learning to read the terrain and recognize which rock you're actually looking at. So in today's video, we're going to talk about how to identify precious stones hidden in roadside rocks. First, you'll learn how to read the terrain and recognize whether you're standing next to pegmatite, schist, basalt, or something else. Then we'll connect each rock type to the gemstones that can form in it. After that, we'll talk about how to collect those stones safely, keeping a safe distance from both the traffic and the rock wall, taking advantage of what is already exposed without digging deep. And at the end, I'll show you how to organize all this knowledge into something you can carry with you on any road trip. If you spent much time driving, chances are you've already passed rocks with gem potential without realizing it. After this video, the idea is that every road cut stops being just scenery and starts looking like a real opportunity. And to get there, we start with the basics, reading the terrain. When you see a road cut, the first question is not, are there gemstones here? The first question is, what kind of rock is this? The answer to that question tells you whether it's worth spending time there or not. So picture yourself having pulled over safely and standing in front of the rock wall. What should you be looking at? One of the most common groups of rocks in hilly and mountainous regions is metamorphic rock, especially schist and nace. Schist is the rock that breaks into plates, almost like layers of rock, pages. Under light, you'll see lots of shiny mica flakes, like tiny metallic scales. If the rock splits easily into thin slabs and shows that mica sparkle, there's a good chance you're looking at schist. Nice is closely related, but has a different look. Instead of thin layers, it shows alternating light and dark bands stretched out through the rock. You can often see quartz and feldspar crystals with the naked eye, and the rock is more massive, not as easy to split into thin plates as schist. When you see that banded texture with light and dark stripes, you're probably looking at gneiss. These two rock types are typical of old, high-grade metamorphic terrains, where minerals like garnet, kyanite, and sometimes corundum can form. Another very common group in road cuts is igneous rock, especially granite and pegmatite. Granite is probably familiar, a light-colored rock with grains of quartz, feldspar, and darker minerals like biotite. In road cuts, it usually shows up as solid blocks with medium-sized grains. Pegmatite is like oversized granite. The crystals are much bigger, sometimes several centimeters long, and you can easily pick out quartz, feldspar, and other minerals by eye. When you find a light-colored rock with very coarse crystals and clear mineral grains, that's a strong pegmatite candidate. And pegmatites are classic hosts for gemstones. You'll also run into dark igneous rocks, especially basalt. Basalt is usually dark gray to black, fine-grained with no large crystals visible. In many cases, you'll see small rounded holes, ancient gas bubbles. 
These voids may be empty or filled with lighter minerals like quartz or chalcedony. In volcanic regions, this is the rock that often hosts agate and amethyst geodes. In many areas, roads also cut through sedimentary rocks. Sandstone, limestone, shale. Sandstone looks like cemented sand, often with clear layers, visible grains, and a rough feel. Limestone is more compact and light-colored, frequently grayish, and reacts with weak acid. Shale is darker and breaks into very thin, flat sheets. As a group, these rocks are not the main hosts of the classic gemstones, but they can contain common opal, chalcedony nodules, and gravel beds that trap resistant minerals. Finally, in some places, you might find ultramafic rocks and serpentinite. These usually have greenish tones, a somewhat smooth, waxy feel, and irregular dark patches. Serpentinite, in particular, stands out with its green color and its association in the right geologic context with nephrite jade and other special minerals. You don't have to nail every exact scientific name on the spot. What matters is recognizing patterns. Coarse, light-colored rock with big grains. Think granite slash pegmatite. Dark rock with lots of holes. Basal, layered rock with strong mica sparkle. Schist, banded rock with light and dark stripes. Nice, greenish, smooth, oily rock, serpentinite or related ultramafic rocks. Once you get used to this quick reading of the terrain, the entire highway system starts to look like a giant open air geologic map. And that makes it much easier to move on to the next step, connecting each rock type to the gemstones it can hide. But which gemstones can actually be found in each one? Well, when you identify pegmatite, that coarse grain, light colored rock with big crystals of quartz, feldspar, and other minerals. Your internal alarm should go off for tourmaline, beryl, and topaz. Tourmaline often appears as long prismatic crystals, sometimes nearly black, sometimes deep green, blue-green, or brown. They may still be locked in the rock or already broken free and lying in the gravel at the base of the slope. Beryl shows up as hexagonal columns with colors ranging from green to pale blue, aquamarine, or even colorless. Topaz can appear with strong luster, sharp crystal faces, and high hardness. In many roadside pegmatites, the most interesting crystals have already been freed by weathering and sit mixed into the loose material. In associated granites beyond abundant quartz, you may find well-formed quartz crystals, clear quartz, smoky quartz, and in secondary veins, small pockets of amethyst or citrine. At the contact zones between granite and neighboring metamorphic rocks, Garnet is relatively common, appearing as rounded or multi-faced crystals in shades of red to reddish brown that stand out from the host rock. In schist and gneiss-dominated terrains, you enter the world of metamorphic gems. Mica-rich schists often host garnets, which show up as little red wine or brown balls or dodecahedral crystals. In some aluminum-rich schists, kyanite appears as blue-bladed crystals with a glassy luster. In certain settings, especially where aluminum-rich rocks meet metamorphosed limestones, marbles, corundum can form. The same mineral that, when colored and clean, becomes ruby or sapphire. There, you may see pinkish, reddish, or bluish spots and crystals in a pale matrix, signaling corundum. In basalt and other dark volcanic rocks, the gem list changes. Here, the main targets are geodes and nodules. Rounded cavities may be lined with quartz crystals to form amethyst geodes or with banded chalcedony to form agates. When these geodes break free from the host rock, they become rough brown nodules that look very ordinary from the outside, but can be spectacular inside. In some specific localities, small cavities host peridot, olive green crystals with a bright glassy luster. In serpentinite and ultramafic rocks, the main candidate is nephrite jade. It doesn't form large separate crystals, it forms massive, compact green blocks with a fibrous internal structure. Nephrite can be found as solid chunks within the rock or already broken loose downslope. Once polished, it shows the classic soft jade translucency that's highly valued. Sedimentary rocks, while not the primary host for most classic gemstones, can still yield common opal in cavities, chalcedony nodules in silicified zones, and most importantly, old gravel layers where resistant minerals from elsewhere get trapped, garnet grains, zircon, rolled quartz, and agate fragments and more.
And don't forget the material that collects at the base of the road cut. Rainwater carries rock fragments, loose crystals, and heavy minerals down slope, concentrating them in roadside gravel, small drainage channels, and ditches. In that roadside gravel, you might find clear quartz, amethyst, loose garnets, bits of tourmaline, broken pieces of geodes, and many other indicator minerals. Often what you can't clearly see in the rock wall shows up concentrated and much easier to spot in this naturally sorted loose material. When you combine rock reading with this understanding of which gemstones match each environment, the search stops being random. Instead of picking up every shiny pebble, you start looking for specific signs in specific places with a much higher chance of finding something truly interesting. The next step is learning how to collect these stones safely. Now it's time to actually pick up stones, but without forgetting common sense. The roadside is a place with real geologic potential, but also obvious risks. So before you think about tourmaline, garnet, or amethyst, safety comes first. The first thing is keeping a safe distance from traffic. It makes no sense to stop on blind curves, narrow shoulders, or spots where cars are passing within inches of you. Whenever possible, choose sections with wider shoulders, pull-offs, side roads, or entrances where you can step away from the travel lane and focus on the rock and gravel without worrying about vehicles brushing past you. On the other side, between you and the rock wall, distance matters too. You don't need to stand pressed up against the cut. In fact, in most cases, the gemstones you're after will be easiest to spot in the loose material that's already broken off and accumulated at the base of the slope. Weathering does the heavy lifting. Rain, wind, temperature changes, and gravity break the rock down, free the crystals, and concentrate them down slope. That means in practice, you usually don't have to dig much. You don't need to open deep pits or hack aggressively into the wall. Just examine the gravel, flip over loose stones, gently break apart already fractured pieces, and rinse dusty surfaces so you can see color and luster properly. Many tourmalines, garnets, and good quartz crystals are found exactly like this, in weathered, loose material, without any serious excavation. You also need to pay attention to whether the wall itself looks stable. If you see large blocks seemingly hanging, open cracks, roots holding chunks in place, or fresh piles of rock debris right underneath, that part of the cut may be ready to fall. In situations like that, it's best to step farther away and work only with material that has already settled at a safer distance. There's no reason to stand directly beneath rock that looks like it wants to come down. Simple protective gear helps. Eye protection when breaking rocks, gloves to avoid cuts, and a strong bag or bucket to carry samples. But the most important element is your mindset walking calmly, staying aware of the traffic, the terrain, and the rock stability. The goal is to go out hunting for stones, not for trouble. Once you bring the safety awareness together with the terrain reading we talked about earlier, the process becomes straightforward. You recognize a promising road cut, park safely, identify the rock type, walk down to the base of the slope, and start scanning the gravel and loose blocks. You rinse a stone, see a glassy luster, Notice an unusual color, recognize a well-formed crystal. No deep digging, no attacking the wall itself, no unnecessary risk. That's really the key. The gemstones you can find along the roadside are usually already exposed or almost exposed. Time has done the hard work. Your role is to recognize the right setting, keep a safe buffer between yourself, the traffic, and the wall, and then patiently look at what everyone else ignores. By this point, you know precious stones can hide inside completely ordinary roadside rocks, that tourmalines often grow in pale pegmatites, that garnets love schists and gneisses, that agates and amethysts form in basalt cavities, and that many of these crystals eventually end up loosened and concentrated in the gravel at the base of the cut. We get to the most important point of all. You've seen that even basic hardness checks with glass, steel, and sandpaper already help a lot to separate crumbling, soft rocks from the materials that might actually hold gem potential. You've also seen that the geological context matters just as much as how the stone looks. A dark crystal sitting in a pegmatite block at the base of a road cut is far more promising than the same color inside a piece of broken concrete or old asphalt. 
And you've understood that, even if your find never turns into a top-grade tourmaline or a museum-quality amethyst, it can still have value as a mineral specimen, as mid-grade gem material, or even as a different gemstone than you first thought. A garnet instead of a ruby, a piece of nephrite instead of just another green rock, or a banded agate instead of a random river pebble. But before you rush out to start searching for rocks that could be worth a fortune, there's one last thing you need to remember. Even if the stone you find isn't a tourmaline, that doesn't mean it has no value. A lot of people pick up an unusual rock along the roadside, assume it's just another pebble, and either throw it away or give it away for almost nothing, when it could actually be a garnet, a sapphire, a piece of jade, or another gemstone. That's exactly why I created the book Gemology Journey for Beginners, available on Amazon. It's a straightforward, practical guide for anyone who wants to learn how to identify the most common types of gems and minerals, even without professional tools. Inside, you'll learn simple hardness, density, texture, and luster tests using everyday objects, so you can understand what you really brought home instead of guessing. With this knowledge, you won't have to rely on luck or someone else's opinion. You'll be able to decide what to keep, what to sell, and what to add to your collection with much more confidence. Now, if you're still taking your first steps or just not ready to grab the book yet, that's perfectly fine. You can still subscribe for free right now and watch the next video appearing on your screen where you can learn more about gem hunting secret techniques. Thanks for liking and subscribing. Good luck, gem hunter.